But there's a mystery to money. Why is it, why is it that we're willing to accept pieces of paper and round metal discs in exchange for valuable goods and services? Right? It's the mystery of money. Okay? So what I want to try to do is, and, and the obvious answers are, are, are um, usually not the best answers. Okay? The obvious answers are usually not the best answers. So let's see if the obvious answer is. Anybody figure out how to get away from the band of engines yet? I can't say engines either, right? That's not, I'm sorry. But my, my grandma, my grandmother was the, my grandmother's grandmother I think was a Mohawk, which is a tribe up around here somewhere, not too far from here. So I, I, does that allow me to say engine or not? It does. That's close enough that I can say engine? I, I are you recording this, Mike? Great. Can you edit that out? No? All right. Um, anybody figure out how to get away or we'll wait for discussion groups? You yeah, hadn't even thought about it. How to get away from the band of... I got an idea. <laughs> okay, I'll give you one shot at your idea. I didn't say it was good. I said it was good. All right, let me hear. Just shoot the first one and the other was fall over like dominoes because they're in a straight line. Nah, that, that won't, that's a good guess, but that won't work. And no, you can't shoot the first one and your arrow go all the way through them because you're a superhero, okay? That doesn't work either, okay? Use the force and choke them all, okay? Right, right. Shoot the first guy in line. Why? Because the marginal cost now of being first in line goes way up, right? So do you want to be the first guy in line? So rationally, you don't want to be the first guy in line anymore because if you're first in line, what will happen? You will die, right? Okay? So, but, but once you convince them that you're going to shoot the first person, and look, we can make lots of, well, what if they're, you know, insane, you know, headless faceless bodies and they don't care if they die. Okay, sure. You know, as Roger Garrison once said about lifeboat situations, boy, am I glad we don't live in lifeboats. So, but I mean, it's a really cool way to think about what economics is and the idea of this marginal principle of value, okay? And we also know, we were talking about this earlier, nobody values his life infinitely high, right? People can tell you that, but I know you don't. I know every one of you doesn't, okay? Because you got here today. Every one of you did something today that you could have died doing. And you still made it here. Which would mean either that you value my lectures more than infinitely high. Okay? Or you don't value your life infinitely high. Which means there's a finite value on your life. Because if you valued your life infinitely high, any risk you would take would make that anything times infinity even though I'm an Austrian, I can multiply, okay? For that's an inside joke for the Austrians. And I also teach econometrics, but please don't tell anybody. Um, uh, anything times infinity is infinity, right? So that means the risk, even if it were teeny weeny weeny of you dying, teeny weeny times infinity equals infinity. So that would mean the cost of getting here was infinitely high. And we already know that we're rational. We weigh costs and benefits. And since you, I'm pretty sure you don't value these lectures infinitely high plus one, then you don't value your life infinitely high. And, all the, and you're willing to trade your life or at least some small chance for your life to do something beneficial. So nobody values his life infinitely high. Right? And economics can tell me that. It's really pretty simple. All I have to do is observe. Right? All I have to do is observe. So, but anyway, let's talk about money, the mystery of money. What is money? Okay. What is money? And what we want to do is look at what money is, find out what money is, and look at the effects. Try to look at the effects of money, um, uh, money, where money comes from. Look at the effects of money. Look at maybe its purchasing power, how it's determined, and then talk a little bit about inflation. Because we can let the cat out of the bag on the last part on inflation. Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And I know that Milton Friedman has stood pretty much right here in this spot, so I'm kind of channeling him a little bit. 
but he's right, okay? Money is always in everywhere a monetary, inflation is always in everywhere a monetary phenomenon. If you don't have money, you don't get inflation, period. Inflation does not exist in places where there is no money. And we'll talk about how that happens. So when the Fed looks up and says, gee whiz, we don't know how we got this inflation, either they're stupid or lying to you. Or there might be another option, like they're obfuscating or something like that. But and the reason we have inflation is because the Fed creates inflation, period. End of story. High oil prices don't cause inflation. Limited resources don't cause inflation. Wage push doesn't cause inflation. There's only one reason for inflation. Money, period. End of discussion. But we'll get to that discussion and I'll tell you why or show you why a little bit later. But first, if I say all that, then I've got to know what money is, right? What's money? Well, one of the things that's really important if we think about the, the social phenomenon, remember my first night I said that, or um, I, in my first lecture I said that economics believes that all social phenomena emerge from the actions and interactions of individuals who make choices after weighing additional benefits and costs to themselves. You think I've said that line a few times? Okay. Um, well, money is a social phenomena. Money is a social phenomena. So if money is a social phenomena, it must have emerged from the actions and interactions of individuals who made choices after weighing costs and benefits to themselves. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the origin of money. One of the other things that Austrian economics, especially Hayek, is famous for is this idea of spontaneous order or what we call of human action but not of human design. Right? Of human action, but not of human design. There's a long German title in, in, in Menger's second book on, um, I don't remember the, the investigations, I think. It's investigations into something, 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 and the, the title's 17 words long that turned into one German word. I, for you guys that understand German, I don't get that, but all we got to do with German stuff is just keep on, you know, in English we tack on lees and edges and stuff like that and they just tack words together, just paste them, and put it here and there and capital S in the middle and <laughs> stack some stuff together and we get a word. I don't fully understand it. But anyway, it's the investigations, the Das Untersuchungen or something like that is what it's called. But anyway, one of the things that's really important in Austrian economics is this idea that there are many useful institutions that are of human action but not of human design. Okay, of human action but not of human design. That bothers a lot of people. Okay, it bothers a lot of people a lot that a very many social institutions that we have were not designed by anybody. They just happened. We could tell lots of stories about how they might have been designed after the fact, and one of the terrible things is if you try to go back and try to design them, they won't work. You can't design them. Fundamentally impossible to design. Money is one of those things. So I want to talk about the origin of money. Then I want to talk a little bit about what's called the regression theorem, Mises' regression theorem. We'll talk briefly about that. Talk a little bit about the quantity theorem, money, how we get from money to banks, to bank-issued money, to money today to um, the idea of the importance of money in macroeconomics and that will kind of leave you off for, for Ben's discussion I think tomorrow or the next day on business cycles and macro or something like that. Um, I love, I could talk forever about Austrian business cycle theory. I absolutely, a bunch of my research is in Austrian business cycle theory and I, I wrote a paper that won an award for it so I'm pretty proud of that. But I'm, I love Austrian business. What makes me an Austrian is Austrian capital theory. I love capital theory, but I'm going to stay away from it and talk about money. Okay? So let's talk about the origin of money. Where did money come from? Okay? Money is a spontaneous order. It's a result of a spontaneous order. It's, again, of human action, but not of human design. So let's think about where money came from, the emergence of money. Right, the emergence of a social convention. Again, remember, there's a mystery to money. We have an arbitrary convention of accepting these pieces of paper and metal slugs in exchange for things that are valuable. Right, we accept useful things for basically things that are not useful, paper and discs of metal. Why do we do that? Well, Manger in 1890-something, wrote a paper called On the Origin of Money. It's, it's a great paper. It's relatively long, but it's a great paper to read. I think it was in the... 
Uh, I can't remember it. But if you look up Menger Origin of Money, Google it, you'll find the paper. It's a very good paper. Um, money we're going to talk about is an invisible hand theory of money. To kind of borrow Nozick's term from Anarchy State and Utopia, he said there's invisible hand explanations of things, which was kind of refining this idea of human action but not of human design. And that's a book, by the way, anybody's ever read that and made it through it in one sitting, God bless you, because that book made my head hurt. Anarchy, State, and Utopia is the densest book I've ever read in my life. But boy, was it rewarding when I was done. So if you ever get a chance to read Anarchy, State, and Utopia, read it. But your head will explode before you're done. I promise you. Unless you're a philosopher, I, I think their brains are impervious to explosion. I think they're impervious to lots of things, but I'll find that out next year while I'm teaching South Park, I think. So, all right. So... Let's go back and think about where money came from. Well, if there's no money, how do we trade? We barter, right? We direct exchange. The orange owning Apple Wanner trades with the Apple wanting orange owner. I think I said that right. Anyway, so one of the problems we have is what sometimes is called coincidence of wants. I, I'm, I, Larry White once said that he didn't like that phrase very much. I'm not a big fan of it either because it's not coincidence of wants. I have an apple and want an orange. You got an orange, want an apple. There's nothing coincidental about that. We want two different things, right? What there has to be is a, a reciprocity of wants. I have to have something you want and you have to have something I want. Okay? Now, if you have an apple and you want an orange... And I, you got to go find somebody who has an orange but wants an apple. The transactions cost of that could be pretty high, couldn't they? So you could wander the earth like a modern day or ancient day, who's that dude, Diogenes? Right? Wasn't that the dude with the lantern looking for the honest man? Right? I'm looking for an A. You're holding out your apple looking for an orange. Right? Wandering the countryside. You know, orange, orange, right? Wandering the countryside. It could take a long time. You may decide you're just going to eat the apple, right? Uh, you get scurvy or something, but that's a different story. Your lack of citrus. Um, <laughs> direct exchange isn't going to work for very long for very many things, is it? Direct exchange isn't going to work for very long or for very many things. Is it? It's going to make it difficult to trade, okay? So what you might do, again, is find an indirect exchange. Hey, the guy that has an apple, has an orange, wants a banana. This dude over here has got a banana, wants an apple, so I'll make a trade and I'll trade him the banana. So now I've made an indirect exchange, and he's done the same thing, okay? Well, imagine what the world would be like when we all go down, for you ancient Greek scholars, we all go down to the Agora, right? And we hang out at the Agora, and we're making trades, right? And uh, the Agora means the marketplace, right? and we're out of the city-state. They let us, because we can't do any exchanging in the city-state. That would be dirty, right? And we can't let the artisans in there either, because, ooh, you know, we're, we're special. We're Democrats, and we're the, right? And uh, Sheldon talked a little bit about the difference between ancient freedom and modern freedom, right? Um, we're making trades, and we're all making these direct exchanges, if we think about the way trades are going to happen, I'm going to start to notice, and it would make sense for me to notice, because I'm rational, and it would be my incentive to notice that, hey, some stuff is a little bit easier to trade than other stuff. Right? I find it's a whole lot easier to trade wheat for almost anything I want than it is to trade apples. Right? And the wheat dude likes apples. So I trade them all my apples for wheat. Now I can get I can get some bananas and some oranges and some mutton and some some you know other stuff. I can make trades, and wheat is relatively easy to trade. Menger argued in his article that there are some goods that are more saleable than others. We don't use that word very. It's not a word you run into very often anymore. Saleable is what he said, but marketable. Some things are easier to trade than others. Now, wouldn't it be in your incentive to pay attention to those things that are easier to trade? Well, if you find that they're easier to trade, and you, find, you make a profit from doing that, we also know that entrepreneurialness is imitated, right? So other people are going to imitate you. Wow, that, that stuff looks like it's easy to trade. So we're going to have, you know, imagine goods A through Z, 
right? And we're trading A through Z, and we find out that, you know what, A and Z aren't very tradable at all. They're kind of hard to trade. So I won't take A and Z in a trade, and everybody else notices that. Then we kind of notice that, man, B and Y aren't very tradable, and C and X aren't very tradable. But all these other goods are relatively easy to trade. It makes sense for me to take goods that I don't want because I can trade them later for things that I do want. So we have this process where everybody's noticing that there are some costs, some goods that are easier to trade than others. Over time, what's going to happen? The goods are going to be winnowed down, winnowed down, winnowed down from, you know, we'll go to A, C to X and D to W and E to V and I'm, now I'm stuck. Um, S or T or something in there, that something. And, and we're going to go all the way back until we get to M is standing all by itself, right? There's one good that everybody will take in exchange for everything, right? These goods that I'm using to make trades, sometimes we call media of exchange, right? Why? Because they're in the middle of an exchange, right? Because that's what the word medium means, right? In the middle. So I, they're media of exchange. Wheat, right? Maybe corn, maybe things that don't perish very much. You know, some stuff not so good as others, and we have lots of words in the English language comes from things that do this, like the word salary comes from the Latin word for salt because Roman soldiers were paid in salt. It's a bad day if you get paid when it's raining, okay? Uh, the word pecuniary comes from the Latin word for cattle. Pecuniary is a fancy word for monetary because cattle used to serve as money. It's hard to make change with a cow, right? Now that'll be three quarters of a cow, please. You're dragging home a leg, right? <laughs> Look what I bought. I bought an HD TV and I got a cow leg coming home. That's, wife is throwing you out of the house. Get that cow leg out of here. What's wrong with you, right? The cows don't make very good money. Korean, in Korea, women's hair traded as money. You can imagine the problem there. You start to see like we had, Ali was getting dressed up in different clothes and brought back in line. The men are going to start growing their hair long, right? We got a problem there, right? But, but lots of things were used as money. Over time, we tell the story what's going to happen. Something's going to emerge, and one day from all of the media of exchange, one will be king of the mountain, right? One will end up being left on top of the mountain. All the other guys got shoved down the mountain and will have the generally accepted medium of exchange, better known as money, right? What is money? Money is as money does, right? What's the definition of money? What is money? Money is as money does. What does money do? Money serves as a medium of exchange, right? I'm trading, at some point, I will trade this lecture for an orange, right? But I'll have to go to Florida and find an orange grower to trade for me right now. Or an apple, okay, he's got an apple. At one point, I will trade this lecture for an apple, right? And by the way, I really miss northeastern apples. Those got to be local apples. That apple right there was really, really good. They, they don't, what's that? All right, cool. Can I, well, you guys can polish it for me, and, um, and remember those, don't forget those um, evaluations. Um, so imagine when we, imagine if you guys, any of you have studied money and banking, there's usually this list, I call, them the, I call it the list of bulls for money when it's all done. Okay, and we'll, I'll try to remember the list. I didn't write it down, and I always say I'll, I'll remember it, and I, usually I remember it, but like after eight or ten iterations. But at, at some point in time, there's only going to be one generally accepted medium of exchange, a gamo, if you will, right? Generally accepted medium of exchange. This, this good, and it had to be a good. How do I know it had to be a good? Because it was trading on the market for other things before an indirect exchange. So it gets all done, and it turns out to be a good. Generally, over history, what did it turn out to be? Precious metals, right? Gold, silver, typically gold and silver, right? More, tip, more often gold than silver, okay? So money, if we say, all right, we get all the way to the end, and gold is money, okay? But gold had to be useful 
as a good before it could be money, right? Aristotle, unlike logic, right? Aristotle just didn't go money, right? Like he threw logic from his forehead, right? Logic, right? Aristotle was a brilliant man. He just chunked logic right out of his forehead, right? But he didn't do that with money, although he likes to claim, because Aristotle made some interesting claims about money and exchange, right? Because he claimed equivalence exchanged. And we already know equivalence won't exchange because transactions cost aren't zero. You'd be out of your mind to trade two things that were exactly equal because that means you ended up worse off because you had to incur a cost to make the trade. Right? Logic, logic says we won't trade equals for equals. Well, Aristotle was a brilliant man. He was wrong about that. And he said money was sterile. He was wrong about that too. But Marx took that and ran with it and that's a whole different kettle of fish. But... So what do we get? We get to the point where one day we discover one thing's left and that's money, right? And that's money. This process of convergence comes from what modern day economists might call the network effect, right? We're making trades, we're noticing some things are more easy to trade than others. You're noticing some things are more easy to trade than others. I'm noticing some things and what are we all doing? We're mutually reinforcing like my highway example from the first night, we're mutually reinforcing this idea that this good is more saleable than others. As we mutually reinforce that, back and forth, some goods fall away, and again, we're left with the king of the hill. So through our own self-interest, by making choices in our own self-interest, we end up with money. Right? Nobody designed money. Nobody said, hey, you know what we need? What we need is money. Not even Aristotle, right? But we got money. It looks like somebody did that, doesn't it? It didn't, right? It emerged. And I'm going to show you another theory here in a second about how, how that could happen, okay? The implications about money in the economy, some of the impl important implications are this. Everybody sells for money. Everybody buys with money. Right? In a, in a market economy, everybody sells with money, everybody buys with money. And, and, and let's not worry about the 14 trades out of 100 billion that happen barter. Okay? Yes, sometimes I trade my, ja my iPod for your jacket, and sometimes I trade my car for some advertising. And, and I might stay in a hotel room this weekend that the NCAA traded for advertising time on the wall outside. Okay? We're, those things are so small as to really be inconsequential in what we're talking about, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're living in, and the, what's the GDP? Three and a half trillion dollars? Four? I don't even know. I, I always forget to look it up. The, how big is the GDP right now? 13 trillion, okay? 13 trillion dollars, and we made a couple ten bucks trade on barter. <laughs> Let's not worry about that, okay? Ten out of 13 trillion is relatively small, okay? Um... Because somebody's going to ask and say, no, I know some, tra it, really inconsequential to the whole grand scheme of things, right? Um, everybody buys for money, everybody sells with money, right? The saleability of money, we're going to see, has certain properties that are important for macroeconomics, and we'll come back to that in a second, I hope. Um... The other functions of money that a lot of times you read in money and banking textbooks and stuff are subsidiary to it, right? It's the unit of account, okay? It's a store of value. Well, the unit of account and the store of value are subsidiary to the medium of exchange function. Why does it become the unit of account? Because everybody's trading in it. So when we start to talk about prices, how do we talk about them? It, it, how many units of the medium of exchange will use? Is that a necessary condition for something to be money? No. It could be money without that. We could talk about them in something else, but it wouldn't make sense, right? If we're trading in gold pieces, we're going to talk about how many gold pieces this would trade for. Okay? The unit of account or the store of value. Well, if I'm carrying, if you're willing to trade money for something, use it as a medium of exchange, well then it must have some store of value, right? That's subsidiary 
to you using as a unit of exchange. Those things happen, but they're not necessary for something to be money. They come out of the fact that something is money. Okay, so usually you hear in a money and banking textbook that what money is is something that has to be a medium of exchange, a store of value, and a unit of account. Well, the only thing that matters is the medium of exchange. There's a great article, I can't remember from when it is, it's mentioned in a couple of places, on, um, and it's in Pete Betke's textbook on um, cigarettes being used as money in a prisoner of war, of war camp. Okay? How much store of value and unit of account do you think those really were? Probably not very much, right? But they were still used as money. They still use the medium of exchange. So those things are important, but not as important as most textbooks would have you believe. And again, I'm trying to understand how money, how, how we get to money. Again, Menger emphasized when we talked about this is an invisible hand theory of money. Okay, so we have an invisible hand theory of money, and now we have these two other subsidiary things come out of that. Okay, they come out of that. Um, first, the, one of the other implications is the first money that we get has to be a commodity money. Right? It had to be a commodity. I've already said that once, but we'll use that word, had to be a commodity money. Why? Because it had to be traded in another use for you to actually accept it in a trade in the first place. Right? So gold, precious metals, precious ge gemstones and things like that, they're being used in other ways before they're being used as money. Long before they're being used as money. They're being used in other ways. Okay? Now money has a peculiar, a, a, a peculiar, um, a peculiar nature to it because in some ways it's a good like all other goods. It has a downward sloping demand curve. Okay? That is, if the price of it falls, you want more of it. If the prices rise, you want less of it. But the question is, what the heck is the price of money? Right? I know what the price of this candy bar is. It's like two pennies or something. I know what the price of, of, of this book is. It's some dollars. I know what the price of this watch is. It's $30, right? When I state prices of things, I state them in money. So what's the price of money? Well, that'd be an interesting conception. That's a good guess. Okay, what does the value of a dollar mean, right? The problem is, is when we talk about like that can of Coke is a dollar. That's not the value of the can of Coke. It's, it's based on the scarcity of the item. Okay, maybe. Maybe. The la okay, Carl. Um, <laughs> the, the labor it takes. Okay. These are all good guesses. I should have said Adam. Okay. Interest rate. Okay, let, let's dispel with this one right away. The interest rate is not the price of money. And in case we didn't hear me, or there's some confusion, hang on. The interest rate is not the price of money. The price of money is not the interest rate. Nor is the interest rate the price of money. Now, wait a minute, I was saying something. I know what it was. The interest rate is not the price of money. Okay? So, one of the problems is, is go ahead, I'll give you one more shot. Mm, that's kind of like labor. You're going to keep trying. Go ahead, see if anybody knows. Uh, what Here's one of the problems. That Diet Coke right there, if I pay a dollar for it, that doesn't mean it's worth a dollar. What do I know? It's worth more than a dollar. To me, right? It's worth more than a dollar. How do I know that? Because I exchanged a dollar for it. And I gave up something of less value to obtain something of more value. Otherwise, I would be irrational. And when's the last time you said, you know what I'm going to do? What I'm going to do is I'm going to do something that's going to leave me worse off. You don't. Right? You don't because you have plans and purposes and benefits that you think about in the future. Somebody back there, one more try. You want to say interest is the price of money? That's closer. Inflation, she said inflation. Go ahead. This was about, this was going to be my question after the talk. Because um, prior, the dollar was based on the gold standard. Okay. Um, as far as I know, currently, it's really just based on the trust of the government. Because the government doesn't back the dollar with anything. Okay, you know, that's, that's another great question. You know what? I love that question. It's, and the question was, is, 
interest, the, you know, money wasn't backed by gold, it's backed by the government. Let's, what I want to do is hang on, because that's a very important question, is how did we get to where we are now, right? How do we get to where we are now? That if you take this $20 bill and you bring it back, it says Federal Reserve note right on top of it. If you bring it back to the Federal Reserve and you give it to them, they will give you a brand new one that looks just like it. <laughs> right? How do we get to that? So let's, that's going to take a minute. Okay? So let's back up some more. The problem with money is it doesn't have a price. It has N prices. If there are N goods in the world, right, N meaning number, N goods in the world, then money has N prices. So money, a dollar might be one can of Coke or two bottles of water, okay, or 30 seconds of my labor. I'm, I'm pretty valuable, okay, <laughs> right? There's, so money has an infant, infant's wrong word, however many goods there are, that's how many prices for money there are. Now that makes it difficult to think about, okay, it makes it very difficult to think about. So let's change it a little bit and let's imagine that we could, somebody said the value of a dollar, okay? Let's imagine the, something called the purchasing power of money, okay? What, what could a dollar buy, okay? And we'll call that the price of money, okay? Just to make, and it's an imaginary construct just to make life easy, okay? So money has a downward sloping demand curve like all other demand curves. The lower the purchasing power, the more you want. The higher the purchasing power, the less you want to hold. And by the way, when I say demand for money, I mean the demand to hold, like this. So think about it. The higher the purchasing power, the less I want, because that means each dollar will buy more junk, stuff, things, mutually beneficial exchanges. The lower the purchasing power, the more of these guys I need to bring about the same transaction, right? So I get a downward sloping demand curve. <coughs> okay? So... Money has a downward sloping demand curve, but it's different than a lot of other goods because think about this. That cola, Coke right there, has value whether there's a money price to it or not. Right? That has, that has value absent it being exchangeable for anything, right? Money doesn't. Money doesn't have value absent its ability to turn it into exchange it for something else because we've already decided the mystery of money is that it's just paper. Right? The marginal utility, we call it, right? And you can think about marginal utility. Think about utility any way you like, okay? The warm fuzzy you get from drinking the Coke, the happiness you get, however you want to think about it, it's really not important, okay? We can have long discussions on the importance of marginal, what utility means, and all this kind of stuff. But let's think for a minute. The marginal utility of Coke is independent of its price, isn't it? The marginal utility of money is not independent of its price. Right? The marginal utility of money is not independent of its price. Okay, one of the reasons demand curves are downward sloping is because other things equal, the more of something you give me, the less I will value it at the margin, right? Margin meaning one more. So, for example, I always tell a story. My son, over time, I collected lots and lots and lots of baseballs, buckets full of baseballs. My son was playing catch in the front yard with his buddy when they were about 12, and I saw him go back and get another baseball out of the bucket, and I said, what happened to that baseball? He goes, I don't know, it went down over there somewhere. Why didn't you get it? No, we did, we couldn't find it. It was in the grass. So the next day I go mow the lawn, bam, there goes the baseball. Well, really wasn't all that hard to find, right? But at the margin, the value of that baseball to him was doggone near zero, right? He made no effort to look for that baseball, right? I saw him. I built him a soccer kick while he's kicking the ball against the wall. I used to coach soccer a little bit. I got, I got five dozen soccer balls in my shed, okay? I look. He's kicking. I look, and the ball's like from here to the bookshelf away. I go, why, why why'd you leave that ball there? He goes, well, there might be poison ivy there. There might be poison ivy. I go, I don't see any poison ivy because you never know. <laughs> so he had a whole lot of, right? When I was a kid, when we used to walk bo uphill both ways to school, 
Fight off tigers with a ruler, okay? We got one baseball for the whole year. And we played with that sucker till it was dead and then wrapped it up with electrical tape and played with it some more, right? The old guys in the room are laughing because we all know the same thing. These young whippersnappers, they get they, Richard scary games and everything. You know, we didn't have it like that when we were kids. We used to hit acorns with a stick because that's all we had. <laughs> Roll hoops with a stick, you know. We didn't get balls like you young whippersnappers did, right? Before they had balls. Before they had balls, that's right. We had to invent our own games, okay? But... Um, the more of something to have, the less you value it at the margin. I used to always tell my kids, too, you have too many toys. No, we don't. Sure you do. No, I don't. Yeah, you know how I know? You, that one's laying on the floor and it's broken. That must mean the marginal value of that toy is zero. Right? So that must mean you have too many toys. Because when the marginal value equals zero, that means I could take that toy away from you and not leave you any worse off. So either demonstrate the marginal value is positive or I'm going to start taking toys away until it does. <laughs> All right, my kids are good at marginalism, by the way. <laughs> Which leads me into a discussion. Uh, my wife, we're driving home once it's in the old days of cell phones. We're driving north from Virginia to Connecticut to go visit relatives. And I say, have you called your mother yet? And she says, no, it's going to cost like $3 to call her. I said, no, it's not. She said, yes, it's cost. We spend this many dollars, and we get this many minutes, and if you divide this by this, you get $3. I go, are we at the end of the month on this bill? She said, yeah. I said, are we going to go over the minutes? She said, no. I said, then it costs zero. Right? Because we're not going to go over, and whether you make this phone call or not, we're still paying the fee for the month. And I said, it's going to cost zero. No, it's not. It's going to cost this. And I said, no, it's going to cost. And my daughter in the back seat goes, come on, Ma, can you figure this out? It's, Mom, it's zero. You already paid for it. That's a sunk cost, right? And then my son goes, yeah, Mom, sunk cost. It doesn't matter. And then she got mad at all of us, and we didn't talk for the next five hours. <laughs> and, and, and at that point, I learned that some costs, even if they're sunk to wives, they're still marginal. So the best thing to do is just assume they're marginal all the time. But money, when we think about money, okay, what makes money different or makes money weird Again, is its marginal utility is not like the marginal utility of those soccer balls to my son doesn't matter whether there's a price on them. But money, if there's no price to money, there's no marginal utility. So we have this weird, we have this really weird thing about money is that the marginal utility of money, right, which gives us, and one of the reasons why demand curves are downward sloping is because Marginal utility diminishes, right? The more of something you have, the less it's valued at the margin. So guess what? The less you'd be willing to pay for more, right? So it's a relatively simple, that's why demand curves are always downward sloping. Because no matter what, if I give you one more of something, it has to be worth less than the one you had before. Okay? That's the nature of mar diminishing marginal utility. And it's a little bit deeper than that, but I'm going to leave it at that. So that means if I take, like, for example, the marginal utility of the Coke, the marginal utility of Coke depend, gives me the demand for Coke. But one of the problems is if I take the demand for money, let's say I, I look at the demand for money, okay? So we have money demand, okay? Money demand depends on the marginal utility of money, right? So that means the money demand depends on the marginal utility of money. Same thing as the marginal demand for a Coke depends on the marginal utility of the Coke. That'd be the end of the story. The problem is, is money demand depends on the purchasing power of money. Because if there's no purchasing power of money, there's no demand for money. Right? If, if I handed you these pieces of paper torn up exactly the same size as these, you'd throw them in the trash. Why? There's no purchasing power. So there'd be no demand for them. So the demand for money depends on the purchasing power. The problem is, is... The marginal utility of money depends on the purchasing power. We got an issue here, don't we? Anybody know anything about circles and where they start and where they begin? And whether or not they can be made square? That was another thing that Hobbes wanted to do. He wanted to find the formula to square the circle. Yeah, Hobbes was big into that. Again, it comes out of the algebra. It's really pretty cool. Square the circle. Yeah, that was a big move by lots of really thoughtful people in the 17th and 18th centuries, trying to square, can we square the circle? That is, can we write a formula for a circle that's made up of squares? 
right? And it's a, it's an ancient mathemat the ancient or older mathematical problem that that's f occupied the brains of some very intelligent people over time. It's a, it's an interesting problem. So what do we do with this? This is a vicious circle, isn't it? Where does it begin? Where does it end? It's a problem. If I want to take money, right? We we we've talked already once and 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 about the the um. General equilibrium models of microeconomics. Okay, in microeconomics, how many people have ever taken micro micro theory? Anybody in here? Micro theory. Is money exist in micro theory? Is anything more than what we call a numeraire? Oh, by the way, we could trade money here, and the margin utility over the price is one, and we won't worry about it. So we wave our hand at money. We don't worry about it. So if you look at my, in, in microeconomics, money doesn't exist. If you look at macroeconomics, prices don't exist. And there's no connection between microeconomics and macroeconomics, although there's been attempts. And one of the problems is, is this dude right here, what McCulloch called the vicious circle. Well, if we go back and read Mises way back in 1904 and we read Theory of Money and Credit, Mises solved this problem over a hundred years ago. Okay? And he solved this problem with what's called the regression theorem. He says, let's think about the money demand, the demand for money today. Okay? T for today or time, this time. The demand for money today depends on the marginal utility of money today. Right? Depends on the marginal utility of money today. But today, where does the marginal utility money come from? Well, it comes from what I expect the purchasing power to be, right? I have money today is valuable because I know from yesterday money was valuable. So I expect it again today to be valuable, and I don't expect prices to be very much different, purchasing power to be very much different. So the marginal utility of money today depends on the purchasing power of money I expect today. Okay? Well, where did the purchasing power of money that I expect today come from? It came from the purchasing power of money at the close of business yesterday. Because I wake up in the morning, I don't expect prices to be very much different than they were yesterday, do I? I can change over time, but I don't expect them to be any very different. So look what happens. The demand for money then gives me the purchasing power of money, right, at the end of the day today, which is going to give me the expected purchasing power tomorrow. And this thing goes this way. More importantly, if I go backwards, where did this come from? It came from the demand for money the day before. And I can keep spinning this dude backwards until I get where? That's the problem. Where does it end? Well, it ends the day that the demand for money was the demand for the good when it was just a commodity. Sound familiar? That's what Manger said. That money had to start as a commodity. Manger started as a commodity and worked forward. Mises started with money and worked backwards. And they get the same answer. Okay, in, in the natural sciences, they call that consilience. So we have now turned the vicious circle into a harmless helix and we get the regression theorem. So now we can integrate money into microeconomics. We can include money in our marginal utility functions. Now the interesting conclusion of this is making money de novo, just going, hey, here's the deal, this is money, won't work. You can't just go, pump, this is money. So imagine, for you guys that know about the EU and the monetary, European monetary unit, how difficult it was for those guys to put that into effect. It was a very careful and slow process.
and it had to trade side by, as my French Canadian friends would say, side by each for a while, right? And it had it took a long time for that to happen. But we put these two things together and we get the idea that look, money had to start as a commodity somewhere. Okay? Money had to start as a as a commodity somewhere. All right. Real quick then, how do we get from money then to where we are today and then we get back to quantity theory and inflation? Okay, in 10 minutes or 15 minutes or less, or 25 minutes or however long. 20 minutes. Is that what you said? Oh, 3.15, all right. Whew. All right. So now we got gold as money. And we can see where purchasing power comes from, the relationship, and why it has to be money. But we know we don't trade gold anymore, do we? I, in fact, FDR stole our gold in 1932 after he decided the price had to be 121 per dollar because seven was his favorite number. Right? You guys read Bert Folsom's book, New Deal, Raw Deal? It's a great book. I've seen that quote before. Whatever is 28, I think. Why 28? Because seven, I like seven, and 28 is four times seven. That was FDR's brilliance at economics. But FDR and his terrible, and we won't start that. Sometimes we refer to him as the great Satan. Sometimes he's only the son of Satan. But that's a <laughs> kettle of fish altogether. Um, or as Hans Senholtz would say, bureaucrats. FDR, just a bureaucrat. But a different, whole different thing. The first time I ever came here, Hans Senholtz was up there and he carried on about for about an hour about FDR and how much he didn't like him. And Hans Senholtz, if you look through some of these places, you'll see he's part of this place. And uh, money was his big topic, but he was funny. He would talk about flying his airplane, and he flew a single wing, and he would fly in to major airports. And he'd fly, you know, all visual flight rules, and he'd land anywhere he want. And they'd say, what are you doing? They'd tell him. He goes, ah, oh, they're bureaucrats. They don't know what they're talking about. They're bureaucrats. I just fly in the wing of the big jet and fly, and by the time they catch me, I'm gone. <laughs> and so he carried on for... It was, it was hilarious. The word bureaucrat was the word of the day on that night. It was fun. That was back in June of 1994, I think. It was awesome. But um, how do we get to where we are today? Well, let's follow the process again. This is a social phenomenon, so how do we get there? Invisible hand theorem, right? We go from money, we start with gold. If you're carrying gold around, one of the things you got to worry about is, is highwaymen, right? Or Robin Hood, who, by the way, had it backwards. And that's a different kettle of fish, right? So Robin Hood or highwaymen. So what you might do is, look, you might, and, we th and if we think about why gold made good money, real quick, and, and money and banking, they'll tell you, you know, money has to be durable, right? Money has to be portable, it has to be divisible, it has to be, right, all of these different bulls. Well, gold satisfies a lot of these things, right? Gold is durable, it's recognizable. You take in a Sayer stone, you bang it on the gold, and it turns a certain color for purity. Gold has all these really cool properties that we figured out later that, wow, this is how, what money needs to be, but nobody was doing, nobody sat down and went, you know what we need? We need something that's recognizable, portable, durable, Stable in value, right? We, nobody said, we, all these things just happen. It's humbling to think about the social phenomena that emerge out of rational choice. If you get nothing else from economics, it should be, holy mother of pearl, nobody invented money. So how do we go from gold to paper? It's a relatively simple process, if you think about it, evolutionary process. You're storing your gold, right? You take your gold, you bring it over to the goldsmith. Because we know goldsmiths exist because how do, how do we know gold? Gold was used as a commodity, which means it was worked by people into things like jewelry and stuff, right? And for other ornamental things. It was used. So you bring your gold over to the goldsmith. You say, hey, Gary, want to keep my money for me? Gary says, sure. And he writes your receipt. And you take your receipt. And then you go over to, you know, Ollie's ox carts, and you want to buy an ox cart. And you say, Ollie, I need an ox cart. He says, well, that'll be, you know, eight pieces of gold. You go, oh, that's all right. I got eight pieces of gold with Gary's goldsmith. See, I got a piece of paper right here. He says, hey, I do business with Gary, too. How about you just sign that receipt over to me? We signed the receipt over. And now I got the receipt that says the gold belongs to me. So 
we, now we start with the idea that gold, hi Ben, gold is like receipts, okay? Gold is like receipts. Or, and now these receipts start passing. Well, if you start seeing that you could pass receipts, what you might say is, look, Gary, how about instead of giving me a receipt for all my gold, you give me pieces, like one for each piece. So now you have a note, a promissory note, and maybe the note is signed over to me, and I still have to re-sign it. After a while, it'll evolve into, look, anybody who's carrying this really cool note can get the gold from me. And now these notes pass as money. The advent of the printing press makes this a little bit easier, right? Because otherwise, there's a lot of hand drawn by Gary. But these are this is still the inception of paper money, right? So we can see how paper money could start to pass with gold as a receipt, and then later as a promissory note, and then later emboldened and embossed with names and written and, and beautiful pictures and all that sort of thing, right? So now we get paper money. It's relatively easy. The move to, like, checks is roughly the same thing, right? It takes some time. It doesn't happen overnight, but it takes an evolution of time. Like, hey, wouldn't it be really cool, Gary, if you'd let me write out the amount of my receipt? And then you just keep track of how many of those things go back, okay? Which is also where we get fractional reserve banking, okay? For those of you that know the debate between fractional and non-fractional reserve banker, I'm a Larry Whiteian free banker, okay? I'm a Larry Whiteian free banker, which means that I think that if you're a private bank, you want to issue note, private note issue, you should be able to, and if you want to issue it with fractional reserves, you should be able to. And if people want to use your money, they can. So now you got to think about, and we'll get to that real quick, is maybe there's more than just Gary the goldsmith. Maybe there's Ben the goldsmith, right, and Tony the goldsmith, and we're all, all our notes are passing in a small area. And then clearing houses could develop to help us clear the money, lots of other things. After a while, though, Ben being the entrepreneur that he is, okay, he looks over and he says, Dad, go, and there's a big pile of gold back here growing some dust on it, okay? And the wife needs a new car new ox cart, right, because we're way back then in the ox cart time, says, I'll bet you if I just took some of this gold out of this pile and bought an ox cart, it ain't going anywhere. It's got dust on it. So he takes some gold and he buys the ox cart, right? He goes and buys the ox cart. Now there's more gold out in the system than there is notes. That is, there's a fraction of the notes in gold, fraction reserve banking. Now the banker, right, Ben's smart because he knows if he overdoes this, we're coming to him with tar and feathers and ropes with funny knots on them, right? Because if, if we go to get our gold and it ain't there, talk about burning down the house, right? We're not going to be happy with him. So he's trading off the marginal benefit of a fraction versus the profit he could earn by lending it. Now, he's probably what's going to happen is not that he's going to take gold, but he'll lend. You go to Ben and say, hey, can I borrow some money? You go, yeah, I'll give you a couple extra notes, and you bring them back to me, so now there's more notes than money. We get fractional reserve. And that fraction is going to be decided by different bankers with different riskiness, and they're going to try to, and there's lots and lots of literature on this, and we're not going to touch it, and that's going to lead to Ben's discussion on business cycles later, so I'll leave it at that, Ben. So we get fractional reserve banking, we get notes. That's how we get notes. How do we get to the point where there's no gold behind the notes? Well, if you're the king, right? Instead of the goldsmith, wouldn't it be really cool to be in charge of the money? Because anytime the queen needs a new palace or something, right, wouldn't it be cool just to say, yeah, I got all the money I want. So here's the deal. All y'all got to bring your money to me because I need a new picture. I'm looking a little slimmer, a little better looking than I was. We're going to print the money and put a new picture of me on it, right? New gold coins. Oh, and in the meantime, I won't tell you, but I'm going to take some of this lead and base metal. I'm going to stick it inside the coins. And I'll take more coins than I did before. So we debase the money. So it makes sense for the king to want to be in charge of the money. So we get the kings in charge of the money. We get slowly the process moves to now the king can issue paper. Pretty soon the king's paper's floating around and he goes, guess what? The only money you can take in my kingdom is my money. So guess what, Ben? You're out of business, brother. Give me over the gold. I'll pay it for you. And it goes away. Right? That's the process by which you get the, the king becomes the coin of the realm because governments weren't issuing, weren't the first issuers of money. The first issues of money were private banks. It took time for that to happen. Yes? Very quick. So, did banks come first or money come first? 
our money. Or it depends. Do you call a goldsmith a bank? Probably not until what he has is called money. All right, so I would say money. Okay? Yeah. Ben, Ben's scared to death of a run on the bank, so he's going to pay really close attention to what the fractional reserve he's going to issue is going to be. So the run on the bank is likely to cause other things that are going to cause him to do things that are, are in fact, before, in this country, before we founded the Federal Reserve, banks were more solvent than they were before rather than after for lots of reasons, not the least of which is if I run out of money, the Fed promised to give it to me. Okay? And, and the, there's lots of the banking policy. We could spend a whole week just on money and banking, at least. So we'll, we'll it, suffice it to say, Ben's profit motive will lead him not to make too many mistakes in the issuing of, he's likely to be very risk averse in his issuing of currency. Okay. Um, uh, so essentially, uh, a dollar bill is a, or previously was before we got rid of the gold standard, um, was an IOU from the government that said, if you bring this back, um, I'll give you gold for it. So uh, now it's an IOU that says, I'll give you another IOU. It's yes. IOU so, right. So what happened was, is very slowly, we start to accept these, and nobody wants gold. Nobody turns them in for gold. And then one day we wake up and go, guess what? They're not. You can't use gold anymore, but you keep trading these. And we use these. It's not a problem. Everybody's accepting them. And the only thing money needs to be to be money is what? Acceptable. That's all it needs to be is acceptable. Okay? Yeah. Do we know what, first, what society was first developed, like a national paper money type? I don't know, Ben. Do you know the answer to that? First paper money. I, it's got to be England somewhere. It it could it could have been China. Paper paper money. I don't know. It could be China. I don't I don't know. I would that would guess that was my it was I was either going to guess in the British Empire or China. One of the two because those were the two earliest. I, mean, I I don't honestly don't know the answer to where the first development was. Ben, do you? I don't. One of those two. Okay. An interesting note. There's a Caribbean island that uses boulders as their. Yes. And there's a big boulder in the middle of the water that everybody thinks is out there that counts as when you own that big boulder, you're the wealthiest guy on the island. <laughs> it's true. Just to add on that note, that, that story, like I've used it a lot of time last but it's actually that island that uses boulders, the boulders are ceremonial, but they actually use the U.S. dollar. Yeah, I, I think you're right about that. All right, real quick, because we're, we're, we got to get, so now we get to this idea of, of money, of, of um, issuing, and now we have gold completely withdrawn. We have national paper money. We can see how we get to there from a very slow, drawn-out process. Okay, a couple of the macro issues I'll deal with, because this is money and inflation, and then Ben gets to tell the good story about money and business cycles and things like that. Um, when we talk about, again, remember, one of the things that makes money really, really important in the macroeconomic standpoint is that money is half of all exchanges. Right? Money is one half of every exchange. Every exchange in the economy is made, one guy gets money, one guy buys money, one guy buys goods and services. Right? So I, I, when I go to Walmart, and or this morning I went to Walmart, and by the way, God bless entrepreneurial and capitalism because... My suitcase broke on the way here. I went to stick something in it, and the zipper popped as I went to get in the airplane. Now, the airplane is a small one where you don't check your luggage. They put in the hold. So now my suitcase is open. So I look over, and there's Hudson Newsstand. Bolt over there. And by the way, I called him up two weeks earlier and said my suitcase was going to break, and we have a luggage strap. And will you sell it to me for a good price? It was a good thing I did because then they were able to sell me that, and then I also called... Walmart three weeks earlier. I called Walmart three weeks earlier and said, when I get to New York, I'm going to need a suitcase here, so please have it for me. Okay? None of which is true, but isn't it cool? It's almost like I did that. Right? <laughs> God bless entrepreneurs, right? That's what I say. God bless the market. Right? 
because that's how I got my strap for my suitcase, and then Lee took me over to Target and then got lost on the way back. Don't tell me how the hell that happened. I just went straight line, and he was going south, and we we're in Scarsdale, for God's sake. I was, Scarsdale, how do we get here? Good thing I had, good thing I had this piece of technology, my, my phone, my Blackberry with a map on it, and I said, um, Lee, I think we're here, and I think we want to go over here. And he said, oh, yeah, you're right. I said, all right, Lee, what do you say we go home? So God bless this, because Lord knows we would get these in a communist country. So, And if government invented them, we'd all be better off. But it's a whole different kettle of fish. Anyway, so we, let's get back to money for a second. Again, money is half of all exchanges. So we understand where money comes from, what money does. Money has to start as, both a, as a commodity. We saw that in the origin of money and in the regression theorem. Okay, so how do we get from money to inflation? Okay, how do we get from money to inflation? What inflation is, inflation is a decrease in the purchasing power of money, right? Inflation is a decrease in the purchasing power of money. Plain and simple. Okay, so if we think about money and the demand for money and purchasing power, we could draw us a little supply and demand graph of money. Right, here's purchasing power of money, here's demand for money, right, here's the demand for money, there's a supply for money, and here's a purchasing power. Inflation is when that dude falls. Well, there's only two ways for that dude to fall, right? Demand shifts to the left, which means there's a decrease in the purchasing power of money, or demand for money, or the supply curve shifts to the right. How likely is it, do you reckon, for the demand for money to shift to the left? It happens, right? ATMs has made the demand for money shift to the left. Right? Better clearing houses has made the demand for money to shift to the left. Are these things sudden surprises and do they happen very often? So that leaves what? The supply curve shifts to the right. Right? We all know the story about Cortez got in a boat, came east, landed, beat up some engine dudes in Mexico, and took all their gold, right? I'm not supposed to say any of that, and I just did, okay? <laughs> Apologize. Apologize to the Aztecs, Incas, and other assorted native Mexican peoples that Cortez beat up and took their gold. <laughs> So when Gortez, Cortez took his ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. <laughs> no, that was Columbus. That's right. And, and Queen Isabella, right? Um, so Cortez goes to, if discovers gold in the New World, brings it back to Spain. Who knows what happened? Who's an historian? What happened in Spain? Really bad inflation, right? Because he brings back all this money and puts it in the economy. The supply curve shifts to the right. Supply curve shifts to the right. Purchasing power of money falls. What does that mean? When the purchasing power of money falls, what that means is I need more money to buy the same amount of stuff. That's all inflation is. I need more money to buy the same amount of stuff. It's not an increase in the cost of living. Okay, or any of those sorts of things. It's a decrease in the purchasing power of money. It can happen in one of two ways. Demand curve shifts to the left, supply curve shifts to the right. Given that demand curves are fairly stable for money, supply curve shifts to the right. So when the supply curve shifts to the right, the purchasing power of money falls. When the purchasing power of money falls, we call that inflation. Okay, so how do we get inflation? We get inflation from an increase in the money supply plain and simple. If there's no money, there can be no inflation. Right? Imagine a world of barter. Again, we got apples and oranges. If the price of apples goes up, what has to happen to the price of oranges? If we have one apple trades for one orange, and now it takes two oranges to get an apple, that's the price of apples going up, right? It takes two oranges. What just happened to the price of oranges? It went down to a half an apple. So overall, what happened to the general price level? Stay the same. Nothing, right? 
put bananas in there and let banana apple prices change and banana orange prices change and orange banana and apple banana and apple orange and there's be six different prices, right? Let all those change, what happens? They all work out, there can't be inflation. Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomena. No money, no inflation. Inflation comes about because there's an increase in the money supply, okay? Ben, if I steal any thunder, tell me to shut up because I'm going to say something here in a minute just to, to, to kind of finish with this stuff, okay? That means if we think about money in a macro economy, the stability of money is really important in a macro economy because think about this. Let's suppose you find yourself holding more money than you would like to be holding. What are you going to do with it? Right, you're going to get rid of it, right? Suppose you woke up one morning and found out that you had more shoes than you wanted. What would you do with them? You'd get rid of them, right? If you had more shirts than you wanted, what would you do? Get rid of them. Right? If you had more beers than you wanted, <laughs> you'd give them to Ben, right? <laughs> okay. But seriously, now you wake up one morning and you have more money than you want. You get rid of it. Well, money ain't like shoes and shirts and stuff. You ain't going to bring it out to the Salvation Army, right? Or leave it at the curb or burn it. What are you going to do? Going to get rid of it. How do you get rid of it? You spend it. So if you spend it, you're going to buy things. You buy things. The things that the guys that woke up with more money buy, those prices are going to tend to rise, right? Because we see demand curves. The things that aren't going to be bought, those prices may tend to fall because demand may shift away from, say, hot dogs to steaks. Some prices will fall, some prices will rise. So some prices rise, some prices fall, some prices won't change at all. It's always, I find it always amusing when they say, such and such a price rose at more than the rate of inflation. Who to thunk? Who to thunk that an inflation rate, which is an average level in price increases, would have some things that rise by more than average? And some things will rise by less than average. Who to thunk? I mean, just mind-boggling to me to think that some things would buy, rise by more than the rate of inflation and some things would rise by less than the rate of inflation and some prices might actually fall. That's just mind-boggling to me. I don't know how it happens. Okay? Seriously. Think about when people say that, how ignorant they're demonstrating they are. Right? When they wring their hands and say, sure, it rose by more than the rate of inflation. Half of everything does. Half of everything raises by less than the rate of inflation. Why did it rise? Because we're holding more money than we want. Money's like a hot potato. So we start buying stuff. Now, the thing is, is money doesn't work like Milton Friedman said or like Hume said. Hume said, imagine the angel Gabriel comes down, puts a zero on the end of all your money. What are you going to do? Spend everything, and what will happen is all prices will go boop like that. Right? Milton Friedman said, suppose we drop money out of a helicopter and everybody picks it up in proportion to the amount that he already had, what's going to happen? Right? The idea is, some of you may have seen this, the, what's called the equation of exchange. Right? If velocity is constant, I increase m, q is determined by other things, and increases in m lead to increases in p, what's the big deal? m goes up, p goes up, it's not a big deal, money is neutral. Well, you're going to see in Ben's talk a little bit later that from an Austrian perspective, money's not neutral. If I gave you more money, just said, here, um, you wake up tomorrow and there's zeros on the end of all your notes. Will you buy ten times more of the same stuff you're buying today? Or will you buy different things than you're buying today? So will that change demand curves around? Will that have some prices go up by others? For Milton Friedman's theory to work, there's a, there's a specific condition called homogeneity degree zero in demands. How's that for fancy? That means he believed that all demand curves would go like this, boop, boop, and they wouldn't move. It doesn't happen that way. Furthermore, one of the other problems, and Ben will take this up in his business cycle lecture, is the way money gets into our economy is through financial markets. And since it gets in through financial markets, it doesn't get in blanket. It gets in in certain places and injections. So there are injection effects, the same as my little thought experiment. Hey, if you all woke up with 10 times more money tomorrow, would you buy 10 times more of the same stuff? 
No, I quit buying Hofhauser and maybe buy a Sam Adams or something, right? I quit buying I quit buying Chevrolet Equinox and buy a Lexus, right? I, I'd change what I buy. So if we're all gonna change what I buy, changes in money have effects that aren't uniform, don't they? And so those effects are gonna have far reaching implications for the economy. And I'm gonna let ben, ben will talk more about that when he talks about business cycle theory. But money is a very important thing, and imagine then a good, well orchestrated monetary policy becomes very important for an economy. Stable money means stable transactions costs, stable expectations, and stable demands. When money's not stable, when it's changed willy-nilly, rapidly and not rapidly, it creates like a rat going through a snake. It's the same sort of thing. If the snake just ate little tiny rats all the time, he'd be the same fat all the time. But if the snake eats a big fat rat one day, he's going to go like this, and you don't want to be at the end of where the money supply comes out. The same as the rat, because as the rat goes through, he gets smaller and smaller. Then he eats a new rat, right? 9-11 comes along, hey, we'll print some money. Oh, housing bubble comes along, whoop, we'll print some money. That's, that's the long and short of those things. Questions? That was pretty close. Four. That was pretty good. I was only one minute over. Go ahead. It has to some regard. It has, I'm sorry. Will money become digital? Right? Will we not? Will we quit using paper money? Um, I don't know that we'll quit using paper money, but we can see that that's right now. I have a, I carry a debit card. Right? Credit cards don't count because they're not money. Okay? Credit cards are 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 a loan, so they don't count as money. We have to make a final payment, a final transaction. Um. To a large extent, um, we carry less money, we hold less money now because of things like debit cards. So we, um, the demand for money is a little bit different and we do, we're still using what essentially is money, denominated as money, called money, but we're not carrying around as much physically, but we're holding it in a different way. We're holding it more securely in a bank. Will, it ever, will we ever get to the point where we're not even carrying paper? It's possible. I mean, I don't know that we'll see it in our lifetime, but I think it's possible. Um, Would it in, in some way be like the gold thing, where if you turn in cash, you can get digital money like you used to go? I, no, I, I think it'll, it'll, be, it'll be account blips. I mean, you'll, you'll just get marks in your account, but there won't be anything to turn back in. There won't be promissory notes. Um, but it all right now is like when you get a loan, you know what you get? You get a checking account. Right? When you get a loan, you get a checking account. Any loan you take and you get, and if it's like a house loan, you get an account with one check. And you write the check, or your lawyer does, and hands it over to the dude that owned the house. So it's all basically checking account stuff. Okay? And, and um, I, I think it just, it, I don't think it's that much different. I think it's just a slightly different form. It's a, it's a you know, I, I'm not sure. I would say yes at some point, but I um, I'd, I'd be hard pressed to believe there wouldn't be s for small transactions. Maybe technology will change that. You know, I can wear a you know a thing in my wrist that goes bleep and takes it out, and I don't ever have to worry about it. You know, it's it's in, or it's implanted in me or something. I don't. I'd hate to. I never in markets. You never say never, right? Because you never know what an entrepreneur is going to come up with. Yeah, in the back. Um, would you mind about Zimbabwe a little bit? What would you like to know about Zimbabwe? You know, it's a great question. When you're printing the tar about Zimbabwe, when you're printing the tar out of money, you know, I, I don't see that it can end any way other than like, you know, the Weimar Republic, right? It just goes, and we're not very far from that right now, where it just goes, shh, boom, and then we start all over again. I mean, I don't know, Ben, what do you, I mean. Interestingly, right now, quite often they don't use paper money there anymore. Do they? So, I mean, we're getting pretty close. Well, we're so, I mean, you have the idea that other things start to trade as money. The same thing happened in the Weimar Republic. So, 
I, I, when you have a regime that is that big a mess, remember we talked about the importance of institutions and private property and all. This it's a huge, bigger mess than just money. Although money, bad monetary policy can wreck a lot of good institutions, right? You, I mean, it wasn't like Germany in in the Weimar Republic was uh, uh, a you know the Congo or something. You know, it wasn't like it was Zimbabwe. I mean, it was a relatively developed country for the time, and, and that's how important what money can do to a country and how bad, bad monetary policy can affect institutions. So um, I, I, I don't know that we could add much more than that. It's a, it's a good question. Go ahead. I've heard a couple of Treasury officials lately complaining that their, concern, their biggest concern is deflation. And they're afraid that if they don't do things to stimulate the economy, we'll have deflation. What's the danger there? I mean, okay, it's interesting because deflation... I'm sorry, what's the danger of deflation? We have some Treasury guys worried about deflation. The problem is, is there's a conflation between recession and deflation. Okay? Most macroeconomists believe that recession and deflation go together. Okay? There's a lot of good stuff, especially less than zero, written by Selgin and some of the stuff in Horowitz's book that, that uh, uh, there is reason to believe that good monetary policy would allow for small drifting down of prices. But when they talk about deflation, they're conflating a fall in the price level with a recession. Okay, they're mixing the two up because Bernanke even said it. Bernanke still to this day, I saw him give a talk before he became president of the Fed at the Richmond Fed, still believes that the, the depression was caused by falling prices and that the way for the depression to have been avoided was to prop up prices. They divorced themselves completely from the idea of money. Okay? One of the weird things that's happening right now is we printed the living heck out of money, and we're not seeing lots of inflation. Where the heck did the money go? I mean, that, that's, it's a, that's a great question. Where did the money go? Did it go to China? Did it go to South America? Did it go to, where, where in the world did it go? Because as much money as we've been printing, it doesn't take very much to understand that if you print the heck out of money, we're going to have a fall, but we haven't seen that decrease yet. So what these guys really believe is that they've conflating, when they say deflation, what they mean is recession. They don't mean falling price levels. Because falling price levels, think about it, the, from... The inception of our country till the founding of the Fed, if you look at the price level, the, 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 the consumer price index or some purchasing power money index, the price level fell for 100 years until 1913. And we had pretty good growth. In fact, we had really nice growth. We, lots of cool things happened right, in, the, in, in that time period, all the way up until then. So deflation is not necessarily a bad thing, right? If, if we leave, if you think about this, suppose we just had money and we quit printing money altogether. Whatever money there is, there is, period. That's it. No more money. Okay, what would happen? Well, if there were no more money to be printed and we took whatever money supply we had and we used it, as we became more productive, as we produced more output, supply curves would shift to the right. What would happen to prices? They would tend to fall, right? And as they tended to fall, what would happen to real incomes? They would tend to rise. So would wage rates need to be constantly jiggered up? Or would constant wage rates lead to increases in income? So would the increases in productivity make us more wealthy? Right? This is part of Say's point about Say's law. This is all part of Say's law, not the Keynesian bastardized version of Say's law. Okay? That, that when, if you keep the money, Murray Rothbard says, what, and, and man economy say, whatever money we have, that's, the, that's enough. We don't need any more. We'll work it out. The price of money will adjust to fit the amount of goods we're trading. Because remember, the price of money depends on right, lots of this circle. So de when they talk about deflation, what they're saying is there's a recession, and they don't believe the only way to get out of recession is to print money. And the problem is, is the reason we got in the recession, and I'll let Ben, Ben's going to talk a lot more about this in the business cycle, is because we printed money, right? It's exactly the opposite, okay? But printing money buys votes. So if you're the president, 
you want to be reelected, what do you want? Inflation. Right? And you want people to have jobs. So you buy short term, short term changing of the production structure against long term, buying it off against long term job growth. And so that's what that's what's gonna happen. It's it's the rebirth of Keynesian economics and and, mo and and whatever they want to call it, it's all really the same thing, whether you call it monetarism or Keynesianism or new business cycle or real business cycle or any of that stuff. All that stuff is just going to lead to the same thing. Intervention in the economy is not going to fix the economy. I know, Ben, that's a way overstatement and you can fix it later, but intervention in the economy is not the way to fix intervention in the economy. Right, and where do, why are we in a recession? Intervention. Right, we go back to entrepreneurs and profit. If you privatize profit and socialize loss, what's going to happen? Lots of people are going to take risks that they otherwise wouldn't take. And that's why we're in the jack, ja part of the reason we're in the jack part we are. Deflation doesn't hurt the economy at all. Not necessarily. Now, deflation can hurt the economy if it's like this. If you're the Federal Reserve Bank and you promise to be the lender of last resort in 1914, then 1930 comes around, 1929 comes around, and you go, guess what we're going to do? Not only are we going to print, quit, quit printing money, we're going to restrict the money supply. So we're going to do this. Now you wake up in the morning and an angel Gabriel took zeros off of your money. Could that have a real effect? Yes, right? And that's, and that's what happened. That's a big, one of the important explanations of the Great Depression is that we cut the money supply by a third. By a third. That's a big amount to cut the money supply. So deflation depends on why we get deflation, right? Deflation that comes from growth in the economy with a constant money supply is probably not bad. Deflation that comes because the, the monetary authority said, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take one-third of the money supply out of the business. That's probably bad. Okay, so it's, it depends. One more question. I want to get somebody who hasn't asked yet. Lots of people, go ahead, and you haven't asked yet. I don't mean to, but everybody else, you guys have asked, so I want to get somebody different. Um, the uh, inflation comes from a decrease in purchasing power of money. No, that's what it is. That's, it's that's, that, that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. And then that's driven by the demand for money? It's the purchasing power of money will fall when the supply shifts to the right. Right. I mean on your continuum. Oh, this is, no, this would be, this was, this was to talk about the, how to get, how do we get money as part of our economics? How do we fit money into economics? Okay. And how to, and this, there's two different stories to tell with this. Is one is how do I make economics fit into micro? The other one is, how do I show that money had to start as a commodity? And so I showed you this too because it's a famous theorem in Austrian economics and it demonstrates the same as Manger's invisible hand that money had to start as a commodity. Okay. One more? Anybody? Go ahead. Okay, I was wondering, is there any monetary system in the world that's actually based on something that the government can't reproduce like gold or silver or oil or something like that? Is there any country in the world right now that doesn't have no, that has a monetary system that has a monetary system that's not based on government fiat currency? No, but I'm asking: Is there a monetary system that is based on something the government cannot create, like gold? If the money's based on gold, whatever the value of the gold is, then that's what reimburses the dollar. Because the dollar is nothing more than a contract between the government and the holder. Okay, so if I turn the dollar in... I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to ask, are you asking me theoretically is there something that can no. be done or are you asking me realistically is there any economy in the world that doesn't have central bank controlled money? Yeah. Yeah, it's, but... Before you laugh too much, though, remember what Tony just said, quoting Rothbard, any quantity of money can be optimal. 
what they've done there since the collapse of their government, no one will accept bigger notes than what the old government notes were, what he was saying, regression theorem. So people would have kept the expectational value of the old thousands of Mali shilling notes, but no one could counterfeit new zeros onto it. So quickly, competition between everybody counterfeiting it pushed the price of that Somali shilling thousand note down to about four cents, which is its paper ink and transport cost. So since about mid-1997, they've had a pretty stable currency. <laughs> and it's not controlled by the government. So the key is whether or not the government can control it. And look. That, but that's essentially commodity exchanging, just they picked a commodity that was lying. Well, the, the problem is, is nobody picked it, right? The key is that nobody picked it. It's a regression theorem answer. And now we have to finish. So, thank you. Break till four. Damn, my phone just blew up. Yes. You call me anything you like except late for dinner. So we can get rid of inflation, right? We can or we can? We cannot. There's always a certain amount of inflation in the economy. We could. We just don't print money. If we don't print money, print money. That is, if we don't increase the money supply, we won't have inflation anymore. The reason we have inflation is because there's growth in the money supply. So is there a healthy rate of inflation? And if there is, then how do we, what other factors? Okay, it's a great question. Again, it goes back to the pencil problem, right, or, Ni or Hayek's knowledge problem. If there is such a rate of inflation, what is it? How do we know what it is? How do we know what the right amount of money is? And more importantly, can we know? And Hayek would tell us, right, this is, the, this is the one of the, the, the central bank dilemmas, is what is the optimal quantity or the optimal rate of inflation? Fundamentally, it's unknowable. So if it's unknowable, we don't know what it is, right? It, it, you know, the, the monitors would tell you it's 3%. We need to have 3%. Well, but what the, is it based on? No, uh, it, uh, that. <laughs> is it completely arbitrary? Yeah, yeah. So fiscal uh -huh. policy, yeah, just... Because when, when you look at New Zealand targeted inflation for a while, and they said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to target it at zero. It can't be any more than zero. And they said, no, nah, we'll make it one, because one will work. Now nah, we'll make it two. We'll just stay. We'll keep it between zero and four. What so a good monetarist would tell you 3%. Why? Because Milton Friedman said so. But then that means there's a rule. Friedman believed that money should grow by a certain percent every year, regardless of anything else. And that was one of the reasons for that was to create, he believed, if you, if you take my, his micro and you combine it with his macro, and if demand curves are homogeneous to degree zero, which means that if all prices double and incomes double, nothing will change. If you take all of that into consideration, then you let the money supply grow by some percent, say 3%, and you just let it grow like that. Then you create stable expectations. And though of the rate of growth of money supply. And the argument is, is if you do that, and V is constant, and Q is determined solely by real forces. So money is completely neutral. That is, money has no effect on Q. Then what will happen is if this grows by, let's say this grows by 3% a year, long term. Okay, which is roughly what the, 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 the belief is the economy grows at. If this is stable, then if this grows at 3% per year, then this will be zero. And so these two sides of the equation have to equal. So if this doesn't grow, and this doesn't grow, this doesn't grow, and this grows at 3%, I make that grow at 3%, then this will grow at zero. What is V? V is the velocity, and all it is is the number of times the dollar is spent. Think about this as money demand. And it's a central argument, just basically that money is neutral. From an Austrian, yes, money is not neutral. It has calls can cantillon effects. Okay. Sorry. Oh, okay. I wanted to ask about. I'm just. Uh
Mm -hmm. There was the whole central banks versus free banks. Right. So the free banks part is it commercial banks? Or? It would be free. Free banks would be um, um, what are called competitive note issue. So you could have a bank where you just issue notes that that say um, is it Bocani? Yes. Bocani's, right? So you issue Bocani's, and I bring my gold to you, and you give me a Bocani, and then people buy Bocani's, and he might I issue alleys. So now I go to him and he issues alleys, so alleys are floating around and Bocani's are floating around. And they're all exchangeable and we just let them go. And you two now are in competition with each other and there's reason for you to keep the value of your money high and the value of your money high. And then there's also reasons for you to set up to, to now the market will kind of discipline you to make the right, right? She asked me about the right amount of growth. Well, if you're in note issue and you're in note issue, we have competitive note issue. There's, there's forces in the market. Larry White writes a lot about it. Um, my colleague and I had a paper about it in the QJ, no, in the Review of Austrian Economics, I think, on it. That um, there'll be forces set up in the economy that will lead to the right amount in the growth of money. Because when we, when we go to you and we have a demand for money, we bring our gold or whatever it is, we're going to ask for loans in a certain way that are going to, you're going to issue Bocanis or he's going to issue alleys. And what we're going to do is there's going to be forces in the market that will lead to an expansion or contraction of the money that's conducive to our tastes and preferences for time preference and things like that. It's so there's a, an extant body of literature that's, you know, like really, really thick on it. Larry White, George Selgin are the guys to read on that stuff. Larry White and George Selgin. Um, Larry White's history, um, got a really cool book on monetary institutions. It's about that thick. I think that's the title of it. Monetary Institutions, Money and Monetary Institutions. Very, very good book. It's a little bit technical in the back half, but the front half is pretty good. Less Than Zero by Selgin's very good. And uh, Horowitz's Micro Foundations is very, very good. So, okay. Would you say that a good alternative to having the Federal Reserve System would be to have several institutions up, like you just uh, like you well, I'm a free banker. I think we should have we should have competitive note issue. That, that was just the same. Yeah, no, I would have competitive. I believe I believe we should have competitive note issue. One of the arguments against that though is for businesses would raise transaction costs. Yeah, it might. It might, but one of the things that'll also happen is is you're likely you're likely to have clearinghouses developed to help reduce that, and then you're likely to have, especially with technology, that'll work, and you're not likely to get overlapping circles. Right, you're not likely to get 18 currencies trading in this circle. What you might get is a giant Venn diagram of little corners here, little corners here, little corners here, where the, th th more than one currency trades next to each other. But you're likely to get in this area, this currency will trade. In this area, this currency will so trade. Kind of like the border with Canada. Yeah, in, in a lot of ways. And I think the other thing is you would probably only get in a country like this, ultimately four, five, eight banks that would issue notes. I mean, the same as you have a number of banks now, you probably have Wachovia's and BB&T's and Bank of America's and well, Wells Fargo's. Fargo's. Yeah, but, but what I mean is, yeah, I mean, there's what, what, eight, eight banks left? I mean, that's, that, I mean, that's probably what you, that's probably what you'd have. Or, or you might, you mean, it wouldn't, you, you probably wouldn't, and also don't forget for the interchange in the circles, if we're doing competitive note issue, the commodity, which is typically going to be gold, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So if you notice when we talk about